You ever run into an uncomfortable situation where you're working on something and the very thing you don't want to happen but is likely to happen, happens? Hello, it's Ezra from Enia Design here. Now in my particular situation, I work on vehicles a lot and it's inevitable to run across something breaking in the process of replacing parts or vehicle restoration. The automotive industry uses a wide range of plastic and metal parts, and they're put under the extreme conditions, be it high heat or frigid cold. Not to mention the hundreds of thousands of heat cycles they have to go through their entire lifespan. We also have to remember here that like most industries in the world, the part's construction and its material makeup is greatly influenced by its cost. So the part I have here is a brake line clip that holds the two rear brake lines to the body of my Audi A8. On these particular vehicles with four-wheel ABS and traction control, they actually run the two rear brake lines from the front engine bay area along the frame rail to each rear wheel. On this particular vehicle, the lines run around three meters or so, and there's quite a lot of these clips supporting them along the way. I have to say that these are some of the nicest clips I've come across. They're over-engineered just like the entire car, and I really have an obsession with being overkill, and these really put my mind at ease. These were made in the 90s by TRW, which is actually now owned by ZF, and they've served my car well for almost 20 years. They actually have a very unique design in that there's technically three parts here, unlike the more common one or two part brake clips. And I say three because we have a center core here, which is hollow with this kind of rough pattern in here, that helps it screw onto the studs on the vehicle. Then there's this rubber over molded onto that, which helps isolate it from the actual mounting point on the frame of the vehicle. It's definitely overkill, as you likely wouldn't see much longevity gain from this, but it's still super cool how much time they put into every single little detail of this part and the vehicle as a whole. I'm actually glad that they went with plastic on this part because it's one less thing I have to worry about corroding. And though it's lasted this long, plastics that have been through countless heat cycles, UV exposure, and have likely absorbed some moisture, they actually lose their structural integrity. And these clips have become so brittle that they separated at their weakest location when I was trying to remove the brake lines. And I was being gentle, mind you. Now I could just get some generic brake clips to replace these to solve the issue, but as I said, I can't help but be overkill here. Not to mention, I would like to as much as possible keep this car entirely stock with no mismatching parts or jerry-rigging. So first I did some research and had an extremely hard time finding these clips from someone in the US. I found some overseas, but they didn't have the quantities I needed. Not to mention the prices were ridiculous with what they had. So this really sounds as if I backed myself into a corner and found a problem that must be solved with either a wallet or something that can take these plastic spools and turn them into something usable like this. Hmm. So first I used Fusion 360 to redesign these clips in a way that they were remotely 3D printable. I made three parts with the center stud and frame being the rigid ASA or ABS and the support core being a flexible TPC or TPU. I also had to account for the stud sliding into the core, unlike the original design, which was over molded. Next was exporting my models to STLs in high detail, slicing in slicer, and then sending these to the printers to make some very rough prototypes. I wanna note for this entire project, I'm using 3DX Tech filaments. They're extremely high quality filaments made in the USA. Best part is they're actually local to me and they make some of the best filaments on the market. Their biggest specialty is engineering grade materials such as Ultim, PEI, 9085, or 1010. Then there's also PPSF, PSU, PC, Flex, ASA, Nylon, HIPS, and then they have the usual PETG, ABS, and PLA. They also have carbon fiber versions of pretty much every filament that they make, and they've been releasing some really great looking PETG colors lately. This video isn't sponsored by 3DX Tech, but I really like their filaments and I've included a link to their website in the description below. So I had to change the tolerances between the three parts ever so slightly and after some cleanup, they weren't too bad at all and functioned correctly. However, me being picky, I was frustrated with the detail as I wanted the parts to look good, function correctly and print in a way that I had to do little to no post-processing. This is the perfect situation for me to use multi-material and show you how you can make a complex part out of the excellent ASA and support the overhanging geometry with the hips material, which you then dissolve. Initially, I had some issues with the multi-material stripping out filament on the changes. I then realized I had a two millimeter inner diameter Bowden tube in the hot end, 
rather than the required 1.8 to 1.9 ish tube. If you're curious about this, check out the link below pointing to some info on this. After replacing the tube, I got some prints out, but then I had some serious issues with layer bonding. This struck me as odd though, because literally a foot from my MMU Mark II S, I had both of my Mark III's printing ASA and ABS with literally zero issues. And I had made sure I was using the same print settings as well. This led me to believe that maybe I was not wiping enough and my materials were mixing, leaving me with a 80 to 90 percent ASA material and maybe 10 to 20 percent hips. Not to mention they don't bond well together at all. To attempt to solve this, I changed the wipe tower dimensions from the original 60 by 20 millimeter to a 60 by 30. When priming the nozzle between filament changes, I could easily see the transition from the black ASA to the whitish colored hips, and saw a nice improvement as the color was there, 90% plus. However, with this, I still ran into layer bonding issues, so I upped it to 60 by 35. Watching the filament changes again, I could not see any visible color mix at the end of each wipe, so I figured I was all set. However, on this print, I yet again ran into another jam and had to cancel it. I was glad I did, because when I went to test layer bonding again, I had the exact same issues. It appeared better, but still unacceptable, because I need the part to be 100% bonded for the conditions they're going through. At this point, I had had it with my ASA and HIPS attempts. This has nothing to do with the materials or the manufacturer, as I tried changing that too. My theory is, due to the particles being mixed in a single nozzle, it is nearly impossible to ensure a completely clear nozzle between filament changes. This is okay in most cases, since most materials we 3D print with bond well to each other. However, ASA and ABS do not bond well to hips at all. Even with no interface layer, they break away with ease. The MMU is a great setup for printing with multicolor, but I cannot get it to work with multi-material. So with these findings and taking a break from the MMU, I moved on to my next alternative. I made the part extremely printer friendly by extending the faces to the edge of the centered cylinder's geometry, which gave me a flat top and bottom. This helps with warping and also makes the part super strong. This is also perfect as it's the orientation I want to print in as the flex direction is perpendicular to the layers. Printing a few test parts, I got to a point I was happy with. I had minimal drooping in the center circle and had an extremely strong part. I printed a batch of each part and began final prep. So here we are. Start to finish, this wasn't a bad project though the MMU dilemma was a bit discouraging. But we pushed forward and found a reasonable solution. Overall, I'm pretty pleased with how this turned out. I got to save some money, redesign some parts and make them, and get one step closer to having my car's restoration project complete. For those of you with the Prusa MMU kits, I'd like to get the discussion going on how we can fix this issue I ran into. Maybe I did something wrong here, or maybe there's some constraints to this particular extruder's design. You can look forward to more videos on this channel as soon as we get things ramped up. In the meantime, I hope you enjoyed this episode. See you next time on e, &E Design. So there's the new one. And there's one of the old ones. I just left this one on there as well. Just for reference, but I'm going to replace them all with these since they are much stronger. So, there we go.